uh, webinar. Um, and is my screen showing now, or I'm not, I have not. Okay. Um, do you want to just see a few introductory uh, things now while you're working on it, or? Yeah. Am I now, am I now, you do not see the webcam. Okay, interesting. All right, well, that's good. Okay, we're going to give up on the webcam and go ahead and use the main screen. Uh, so please, Dan, get us started. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dan Sutherland. Um, I'm the Associate General Counsel for NPPLD, and I am uh, welcoming you on behalf of Steve Bunnell, our General Counsel, who may be on the line, but I know he wanted to uh, welcome you and thank you for your uh, participation and uh, you know we're um, uh, doing a series of cyber literacy um, trainings um, this year and this is the next of our monthly presentations um, my uh, co-chair of this project is John Besselman who you know has uh, just been named our head of um, legal training he's located down at Fletzy I know he's online and he's texting me about how this is all uh, working out so um, it's great to have John um, on this. I am sitting in the office of American University Law Professor Michael Carroll. Um, we are very excited to see that there are 198 people who have registered for this, which is a great turnout. Um, the, uh, we are really looking forward to this um, hearing the lecture, but we also want to make sure people are interacting and asking questions, and Professor Carroll will tell you in just a minute how you can go about um, doing that. The neat thing about this <clears throat> is that you do not need to be physically here at this time. We are we are very excited because this is the first one of our webinars. In the past, we've done physical presentations when we had a phone line attached to it, and uh, we we know that we're getting a lot of interest around uh, the Office of General Counsel. I think the last time we had. 75 phone lines that were uh, taken and additional people who wanted to get on. But this is the first time we're doing a webinar that we will uh, record, and that means it can be accessed at any time. So 198 people have registered. Um, there's going to be others of our colleagues who want to register in the upcoming weeks or months, and that's just great, and, and we're excited about um, having this opportunity to, um, to have something that lives on and people can uh, access it when they would like to. I'll just make a quick announcement about our next uh, event. Will be February the 23rd. We're going to do a um, we're going to do a webinar um, that features uh, Greg Tuhill, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary at Cybersecurity uh, Cybersecurity and Telecommunications. He's the uh, going to give us a talk about what is the threat, the cybersecurity threat uh, currently. You'll hear more about that, but I just wanted to flag that um, for you. We really appreciate any feedback you can give us on how this is working, how it's being received, the content, other topics you would like to hear about. Uh, we're at, um, tr just trying to design a, a, some presentations that you will benefit from. So we've really appreciated people giving us some feedback in the past. And anything you'll give us now, just email uh, John Besselman or me with, with ideas and thoughts, and we would really appreciate that. Um, so that's enough for the preliminaries. Um, let me introduce everyone to Professor Carroll. Um, he's a professor of law here at American University. He teaches um, cybersecurity law, a lot of intellectual property uh, courses, um, and we're just really uh, so pleased that he could uh, break off and spend some time with us. He's, if you look at his bio online, you'll see all the different organizations he's involved with, but uh, involved with things like the Center for Democracy and Technology, and a number of other boards and um, and projects. Um, he's the director here at AU of the program on information justice and intellectual property. There's a lot of um, writing about uh, the issue of open access to scholarship over the internet. And I think that is, I'm going to guess, that is one of the reasons why he agreed to do this because he believes fundamentally in having open access over the internet to uh, to great learning and thinking, and so he's really gone out of his way to host this uh, this webinar for us and provide this information to us, and uh, so it's a really great opportunity. It's so nice that we're just across the street, uh, but we appreciate you taking the the, uh, the time out to, to do this. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you, and if you just tell us, too, logistically, how do we ask some questions and things like that. So fire away. Thank great. you. Great. 
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and in this format, I don't have to tell you where the bathroom is and where the water fountain is, but here we are. We're together virtually in cyberspace. Um, you should see on your GoToWebinar um, panel a, a chat window and a, a questions window. And you, anytime that I'm talking, uh, please feel free to, to type your questions or um, and I will try to respond um, to those as, we, as they come in. Um, and um, it, uh, it's easier probably to interact through the typing than to, uh, you could raise your hand and I could unmute you, but there are now 122 people on, on the line and the, the, it gets logistically difficult to mute and unmute you uh, remotely. Um, and as Dan said, I, um, and I see I'm on my opening slide, I apologize, I mistyped the date, it's not 2106, it is 2016, although we are thinking futuristically, so uh, you know maybe that was a Freudian slip. Um, I teach a couple of different classes that involve the internet here. I'm, I'm interested in the interaction between uh, law and the internet, and in each, each of those classes I give a version of what we're going to do today, because um, as the general counsel believes, so too I believe that the modern lawyer needs to understand the way the internet functions with more detail and more precision than the average internet user because when you have to do uh, search for information about others, when you have to think about the risks that your client faces, you need to understand technically, at least schematically, what's going on. Um, and of course, the department is, has some of the world's great cyber um, experts. Um, so a question might arise: Why, why, why me? When you've got plenty of in-house expertise. But one answer might be: We're speaking lawyer to lawyer, and I'm going to try to present um, the information about how the internet works from the perspective of what a, a lawyer needs to know or should know. Um, and I'm going to try to be largely conceptual about the design and the functioning of the internet to avoid getting bogged down in all of the jargon and all of the technical details, which often happens when you talk uh, with people who have deep expertise about the technology. It's very easy to go uh, too deep into the weeds. And, and I, I will try to stay above that. But if I get too geeky for you, uh, by all means, uh, send me a question. Um, and for those of you who are already uh, fairly well versed in the technology, this presentation may seem a little too basic, but I'm trying to seek that sort of common level of understanding about about digital technology and, and digital networks. Um, I will be focusing on some of the uh, sort of features that pose risks and, and security issues because that is what a lot of the work of the department is focused on. But at the outset, I, I have to say, from society's perspective, many of the features that create these risks and security gaps are also the features that allow for the ease of the internet to grow, the ease of internet use. And so there's always a trade-off in, in ter terms of those, those features that are beneficial, but also have these risks with them. So as I focus on the risks, Let's not let, lose sight of the strength of the internet um, uh, to provide uh, a robust communications infrastructure. Okay, so here we go. Um, before we get to the internet, we have to make sure we understand the basics of what's happened with the digital revolution. And the fundamental truth or, or aspect to keep, keep your eye on is, is the way in which digital technology reduces all information to a very simple common language comprised of two digits, zero and one. All digital information is long strings of zeros and ones that represent patterns that the machines can then operate on. Um, and what makes digital technology so powerful is this simplicity, um, and this data can be transmitted, copied, modified uh, quite easily. Um, and what's happened over, what's happened since the 1960s is that we've seen ever increasing amount, abilities to store digital data and to process digital data. Um, and and we're, we're still along that growth path um, and, and with each um, sort of advance, 
things get faster, things get more robust. So if you think about high-definition television, uh, that was not possible before because the amount of data it takes to describe an image in that level of detail was too much data for the computers to handle at an earlier stage. Now the computation is buried inside a flat screen TV um, and it's, it's become fairly trivial. So how long before we're living in a world of three, three dimensional virtual reality? That's just a function of taking the same basic rule of zeros and ones and getting faster and having more storage and computation ability. So what makes it so powerful is that the zeros and ones do not have to mimic the source of the information. Analog media such as film or cassette tapes or, or LPs, all of those media are based on analog, meaning analogy. Uh, you have to mimic the source of the information in the, in the media, and it's very inflexible once you've burned the disk, once you've uh, recorded onto the cassette. Whereas digital simply describes the information. A radio broadcast has to use more electricity to send a loud song, uh, I'm sorry, a loud sound. But in digital, you simply describe a loud sound, and the receiving device then makes a loud sound. So all digital information describes text, voice, uh, any, any input uh, just gets transmit, translated into zeros and ones as a description or it instructs. Machines are rule-based devices that need instructions based on a set of, of uh, rules, um, and the zeros and ones are the way in which the rules are encoded and the instructions are encoded. So all digital information, whether it's describing or instructing, is just a string of zeros and ones. Right. Um, and when we think about um, I'm going to talk about the internet, and I think a lot of us are still thinking about the computers that are associated or connected to the internet. But surely you've heard now the, the phrase, the internet of things. And when you think about the hardware, the machines, the computing devices, have a big sense of what that is. All of the physical world is increasingly getting software embedded in it. So we are now talking about chemical plants. We're talking about the electric grid. We're talking about um, cars are just rolling computers. Planes are just flying computers. Um, and as we drop sensors all over the place, more and more of our physical universe will be sort of connected to the internet through these small, ever increasingly small computing devices. And all of these devices are going to speak the basic language of the internet. Um, all right, I think we've covered this. Um, so what happened, uh, the, there are different sort of origin stories of the Internet. Um, it, it, it usually starts with some recognition in, in the Defense Department in DARPA that um, our we were at risk in the Cold War of a nuclear strike that could um, uh, knock out the communications between the White House and 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 um, and the missile command in Colorado, um, and that's because the traditional telephone network has many points of failure, and all you have to do is break the connection in one of those to do that. So research began on using digital technology to create a more robust uh, communications infrastructure by creating redundant pathways in many different. Uh, pathways so no single strike could take out the communications network. Um, and that led to the what is, is called the gro uh, growth of packet-switched networks. That is, we will take the data, we will turn them into small little digital packets, and we'll transmit those digital packets over multiple different pathways. Um, but in the beginning, when we had super, what were then considered supercomputers, the manufacturers were using their own software. Each group of software had their own protocols and rules, and the, the computers didn't talk to each other. I said before, machines are rule-based. You have to have a common rule book for machines to interoperate. With the uh, advent of personal computers in the early 1980s, um, we got some agreement among the research centers that the US government was funding 
to, to agree on a common network language and a set of network protocols that would allow the machines to interoperate. And, and that is essentially what the internet is, is simply an agreement to communicate using some very simple protocols. And those protocols are indifferent to what type of information you're trying to communicate. Instead, um, all, all packets of zeros and ones are treated equally, and this is simply a set of rules about how those zeros and ones will be packaged and transmitted. Um, and that agreement came about in the 1980s with the Transmission Control Protocol, TCP, and the Internet Protocol, IP. If you've heard of an IP address, well, that's, that's what it is. We simply needed a rule for how to give each machine a new numeric identifier so that it could be on the network. If your machine has an IP address and knows how to communicate using the TCP protocol, your computer is speaking internet. And that goes back to the 1980s. Um, now, once you, you build a network, you multiply some of the risks associated with this ease of, of data transfer because this data can so easily be modified, copied, um, um, and, and, and altered. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But just to set you up for an example of, as lawyers, don't be fooled by what you see. Remember that the devices are always just processing data, and everything is just data to the computer. So you might send me a, a cute photograph, a digital photograph, and you and I as humans think that's a picture. We focus on the information that's in the image, or maybe we see the cute video of the panda rolling in the snow, and we think, and, and as humans, that's what's speaking to us. But the computer is just computing on data. So steganography is an example that, that some uh, intelligence services use as a way of transmitting confidential or sensitive information. I can send you a picture, which is just a string of data. The receiving device renders the picture as a picture, but there's also an extra string of data in there that's, that, that's the real message. And as long as both machines are decoding that message, it looks to everyone else like a photo, but in fact, you've just sent sensitive information. So that's an example of the type of risk that emerges when we forget that it's all data and we have to focus on the data, not what we think the data represents. Um, so, if, I mean, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the common problems, but um, you know, a lot of the privacy problems, a lot of the security problems that basic internet users encounter often involve exploiting this difference between what we think we're looking at and what we're and what the data is. So I can send you an email. Inside that email, I can embed a little bit of data that basically phones home and tells me that you opened it and tells me things about your machine. You don't see that happening. I, you know, it's just a piece of data that looks like part of the white background, but you didn't see it. Um, and, and so a lot of these sort of uh, ways in which people get viruses from visiting websites and that kind of thing are, are rely on this ability to, to disguise the data transfer that's actually happening. Um, so I want to think, uh, the other thing to think about is you're thinking about um, machines and the data that they're handling. Uh, and what the relative issues or security risks that they might uh, entail. Think about the layer of the, ex the data exchange or the data uh, transfer at, at which this is happening. There are risks at each of the different layers. Um, and we can think about both the machine itself as having kind of layers of operational capacity and then the network as layers as well. So in general, the software that directly instructs the hardware is the most powerful. So when you turn your machine on, there's a small piece of code that just tells the machine, go up, go load the operating system. But that little piece of code is the thing that directly talks to the hardware. It's called the root file. And if you have access to the root file, that means everything that happens later, once you load the operating system and you load your antivirus software, 
it's too late. You've already got what what is called getting root. You've got root. You have root access to the machine. So as you're thinking about the risks, you start with the root layer. Whatever's closest to the hardware is the most uh, important because uh, that's the most powerful. You can directly control the machine or the device if you've got root access. But we don't want to put a lot of computing power at the root. Instead, we're going to layer on top. So in a personal computer setting, we layer on top an operating system. The operating system is a large set of instructions about all the basic functions of how to print, how to, how to call up other programs, how to interact, how to manage the memory of the machine, etc. And then on top of that, we have applications, your word processing, your, your uh, email. Those all talk to the machine through the operating system. Um, and so your security risk di differs depending on where you are. The closer to the hardware you get, the greater the risk. So manipulating an operating system is, is worse than manipulating an individual application. Um, so I'm now going to talk about the internet. The internet is usually thought of as layers. And here I would read this slide from the bottom up. So we start with the physical connections that allow us to transmit data to each other. And of course, the risks there are the traditional risks of tapping, right? We've seen with um, uh, what, what the Snowden revelations about some of the things the NSA was doing involved physically tapping undersea cables and other directly getting access to the physical layer in order to intercept data. So that will be a risk. I know that. Um, uh, at least one of the attorneys who filled out the questionnaire um, wanted some information about, you know, what are the security risks associated with chemical plants and, and the electric grid? And it starts with the physical layer. All of as, as we start to connect those physical spaces to the physical lines of communication, anybody can just basically intercept that communication by physically inter intervening in there. And so that's one of the risks is making sure we're guarding those facilities and the, and the um, transmission lines in and out of them sufficiently. Um, on top of that is what I'm going to call the network layer. And this is that uh, internet protocol, the transmission control protocol. These are all the basic rules that are agreed to by everyone on the internet in order to exchange data. And the network layer is so powerful because it is indifferent to the type of content that it is, is being transmitted. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of security built in because it's all about ease of interoperation. Um, and, the, and, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the security risks at the network layer in a minute. On top of that is then the application. So um, an application is basically any program that does something. We now talk about apps on your phone, but they've always been applications. If you think about what happened with Napster, once you built this network layer that allows anybody to talk to any other machine on the network, now all, all this college kid at Northeastern University had to do was write a program that everybody, 50 million people, put on their desktops. And they were now using the network as a, a way to transfer music files because the network layer was doing all the transport. And the application layer was just the Napster program itself that was allowing people to listen to the music and to transmit the music files. Your email is an application. Your web browser is an application. Skype or uh, Google Talk or any of those, uh, or, or FaceTime, those are all applications that are riding on top of the network layer in order to use that network layer to do all the things that we use the inter internet for. And then we use those applications to create content like our Facebook page, pin boards, et cetera, um, that interact with the different um, 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 uh, applications. Um, so we talked a little bit about the physical layer. Let's focus on the um, network layer. So the network layer was created by researchers funded by the US, US government creating a network that was primarily for their own use. So they made some assumptions about users that are no longer true, but the network protocols they created 
are still rest on those assumptions. Remember that computing power at the time was much, much less than it is now. You had dial-up access, everything was slow, bandwidth was limited, and all of these network protocols focused on efficiency and simplicity as their primary design goals to limit the use of those very scarce computing resources. And security usually requires additional resources, and that's why we have very little in the basic protocols. It was all about interoperability. Right, So there's no protocol that requires you to show an ID, virtual or otherwise, to verify your identity on the internet. If you remember the old New Yorker cartoon, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Right, That's precisely because you're only identified by the IP address that's associated with your machine, um, and we don't have any of the other kinds of authentication that we might want in a more secure um, communications environment. Uh, instead, we, we rely on the application layer or other protocols to do to, to that security. Um, and this architecture was developed by the Internet Engineering Task Force, which was essentially a group of um, uh, engineers who got together and, and basically decided what these standards ought to be. Um, and there wasn't a lot of sort of outside participation. It was mostly engineers focusing on these goals of simplicity and efficiency. Um, so, I mean, the internet is sometimes called a scale-free network in that anyone can join the internet and it, you haven't broken the internet. There's no last straw. It, it seems that the design can incorporate as many different nodes on the network as is possible, um, and that's been that's been what has allowed for the explosive growth. But it also, the ease of joining the internet is also one of the security risks, right? Um, and it's a public network. These protocols, as I'll talk about in a minute, uh, basically transmit a fair amount of data about your machine every time you interact with someone else on the internet. And that's baked into the cake. It's part of what the protocol does. Um, so, and these are just examples of, uh, uh, once you have the ease of manipulating code, there are going to be inherent insecurities that you will not be, you can't program your way out of some of these risks. So, from my perspective, we really have to be more in a mitigation frame of mind about risk rather than a complete prevention mm -hmm. um, risk. So, just from Wikipedia, here's a short example of the alphabet soup that you, you think we've got it bad in Washington, um, in internet land. So, those are all what we think of as internet protocols. Those are all basic little rules that um, uh, are, are the basis for email, for internet browsing, for all of those things. We're hardly going to uh, uh, go through all of those. I would just focus attention on TCP, that's the Transmission control protocol that just says every uh, digital information will be chopped up into packets. There, these packets will have a identifier, a from address, and a to address, and a, a couple of other pieces of simple information. The IP address is the unique numeric identifier that every machine gets. So if you um, logged in from your office, your machine received an IP address from the server in your office. If you go home, and let's say you're using a laptop, and you open up your laptop, you get a different IP address. Uh, it, it's coming from your network provider at home. Um, these IP addresses are handed out in large blocks to each network provider. Um, and because the only information we have about senders of information are the IP address, if you're in a position where you're doing an investigation, trying to trace an, an attack or some kind of uh, behavior that, that, that is being investigated, you first find out the IP address from the, the site that was attacked. Every web server has a log. It automatically records information about who communicated with it. And, it, and because of these protocols, it will record the IP address of the machine that, that uh, tried to attack you, for example. You can then go to um, uh, look up which network was assigned the block of IP addresses that, that is included in there, 
and then you can contact the network provider to try to find out at what at this date on this at this time what device was assigned this IP address. Um, so, for an example, I and I'm going to switch to my browser. Uh, I hope this doesn't. Um, so, right now, I can I just ask Google to find my IP address. By sending a packet to Google, it revealed that my computer is using this 147.9.2.82 as the IP address associated with my machine right now. Um, and this IP address is what you need to be on, on the, the internet. Um, I'm going to try to go back to my slides. Are we, is that good? Did that work? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. uh, there we go. Okay. So, slight lag. Um, okay, so you're on the internet if you have an IP address and you're using the TCP. And this is important because um, some of the activities of the department involve going after s websites that have illegal or, or harmful content on, on them. If you're in the posture of trying to get that content off the internet, uh, merely so seizing the name of the website a domain name does not get it off the internet. As long as the machine still has an IP address and is still hosting the content, it's on the internet. You might be able to redirect the um, domain name away from that IP address so it's harder to find it, but it's not off the internet. Um, and an example of this, there was a, some trade secrets leaked in the Cayman Islands by um, uh, one of the banks there. And the attorneys went into court, and they sought an order um, uh, taking away the domain name. And actually, it was posted on WikiLeaks. And so they wanted an order blocking WikiLeaks in the, in, in the Cayman Islands. Um, and the judge entered the order, and it didn't matter, because um, soon people on blog said, well, here's the IP address for WikiLeaks. If you want to look it up, just do this. So for example, if I, if you can see on my screen, are we there now? Up here, I have typed in an IP address. So if I know the IP address of the website I'm trying to get to, and I hit return, I just went to Google. I didn't need Google's IP. I didn't need to type www.google.com as long as I know what the IP address. If you have an IP address, you're on the internet. The domain name system is just a way of translating names of, sorry, we can uh, dismiss that. Um, the domain name system, google.com, is just for our convenience as a way to connect this word to that IP address. But it's the IP address, right, that gets us there. So um, just keep that in mind. Uh, oops, that's not what I'm, I want to be here. OK. Um, here's another problem. Um, Dur during the phase when these uh, protocols were designed and you wanted efficiency, everybody who was transmitting data packets on the internet was allowed to effectively advertise the efficiency of routing the packets through their servers. And they would say, I'm able to handle, you know, I got a lot of capacity, send your packets my way. And because it was a trusted environment in the early days, Everyone programmed the machines using this border gate uh, protocol to use whoever was broadcasting the most efficient route without asking any questions. Sure, take my data. You're efficient. Well, that was back then. We're still relying on this protocol to exchange data across different providers. And that means any, anyone interested in, in malfeasance can broadcast the ability to transmit data and then intercept it. Um, so this is what happened uh, when Pakistan uh, accidentally uh, broadcast that it was the most efficient way to YouTube. And suddenly, everyone looking for YouTube was going through Pakistan, and they, got, they lost their access to YouTube, and, and that data was all captured. 
It's another way by which you can launch what's called a denial of service attack. Denial of service just means you send lot, you flood the destination with too much data so that it can't operate. It's just flooded. And you can launch one of these attacks in multiple ways, but one way is to use this border uh, gate protocol, suck in lots of packets, and then redirect them toward a, uh, your, your target website. Um, so that apparently was that what happened uh, when there was a denial of service attack on South Korea, right? And, and it is alleged that that was directed using this exploit by North Korea, uh, folks in North Korea. Um, and the problem is uh, you cannot, this, this is baked into the cake. This isn't like uh, somebody hacking the system. This is the system. It's just one of its inherent weaknesses. Another uh, area where there's risk is our use of the World Wide Web. So uh, it's important the internet is not the World Wide Web. Um, there are lots of other ways to transfer data other than through websites. Um, but the web is one of the biggest applications and uses of the internet. It relies on the HTTP protocol that you see at the beginning of every website that just stands for Hypertext uh, Transfer Protocol. Um, it makes it uh, browsing easy and possible, but the designers of this set of rules decided that there would be some automatic data transfers that would take place behind the scenes without your knowing about it. So, um, for example, Every time you visit a website, you're, a lot of information about your machine is being recorded. Not only your IP address, but what operating system your computer is using, what type of computer you're using, the numeric address of your network card, um, and of course your IP address. Um, <clears throat> and the version of software that you're using, one of the, in the commercial web, one of the privacy issues that's emerged is even if you're good at blocking cookies and other kinds of ways that um, websites try to track you, the unique combination of the version of software, the type of machine, et cetera, is the equivalent of a digital fingerprint. And databases of these combinations are created to, uh, and associated with you as part of your profile. So even if you don't want to be followed on the internet, you likely are because you're broadcasting your unique set of software features associated with your device. Um, in addition, every time you go to a web page, you think you're only asking for data from the server of your destination web page. But every website that has advertising on it is automatically directing your browser to send a request to all of to an advertising website to call up the ad. And so you're broadcasting all of that same information, not just to your the website you're trying to visit, but also to any, any website that has a link on that page, such as an advertiser site. It's not just that, though. For example, um, anytime you go to a web page and you see the like button, the Facebook like button, that little thumb is coming from Facebook. It's not coming from the website that you're visiting. And that means you automatically sent to Facebook all of the information about your IP address, what the last website you were visiting was, um, and all of the software information. Here's just a, a simple set of directions that Facebook gives for how you put the, the, the like button on your website, right? Um, but you are, a URL is a uniform resource locator, right? And it is saying you can uh, basically put this HTML snippet on your machine and it will talk directly to our machines every time somebody visits your, web, uh, your website. Um, all right, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do one more. Uh, I'm getting a message, no sound. Can you hear me now?
Um, sorry. So someone was not able to hear the audio, and I've gotten this. Uh, uh, okay. Now a, a bunch of people saying it, the audio is fine. So possibly somebody muted their own uh, audio. And I have a question. Well, why don't we just block the IP address if blocking the domain name is sufficient? Um, yes, that is is often what you can do, and in fact, um, that's largely how China's so-called Great Firewall works: is that um, the Chinese authorities uh, block the IP addresses that are associated with websites that have content that the Chinese authorities have decided are not suitable for the Chinese audience. Um, the the problem is um, there are ways around that. So basically you can use what's called a proxy server, which is a way to launder your IP address. You log into a proxy server, you then get the IP address of the proxy server. The proxy server then sends the request, sends the data to China, and to the Chinese machine, it looks innocent because it's not coming from the blocked IP address. It's coming from a new IP address. There are lots of other ways to spoof or disguise or, or hide your IP address. Uh, it, is, it is commonly used, but it is subject to basically being routed around. For example, Netflix has just announced that they're going to block virtual private networks. Those are known IP addresses where people who don't have a subscription to Netflix or are subscribed in a different country use this same route around uh, approach to get to Netflix content. Netflix was allowing it. Now they're going to try to block it. And it becomes a sort of game of, of cat and mouse. Um, um, all right, let's talk a little bit about the web. So I was talking about domain names. So google.com, for example, is a domain name. And you, if you look in the location bar of your uh, web browser, uh, let's go to our web browser. <clears throat> we read from uh, we read from right to left. So .com is considered a top-level domain. It is it, it is a registry of uh, it's basically a telephone book for the internet. It's simply a directory or database of names that are associated with IP addresses. And then on, on top of the basic internet routers whose job it is to route those internet packets, there's essentially a parallel um, group of computers called domain name servers. And their job is simply to be the operator, to look up the IP address every time you type in a domain name because you're searching for something. Um, and that's one of the security risks, is what happens if somebody hacks that such that they redirect you. You think you're going to Google.com, but now you've been directed to another IP address. There's a website that looks just like Google, but it's not, and you start exchanging data with it. It's one thing if it's just an internet search, but now what if it's pretending to be your bank, right? Um, and so you typed in www yourbank.name.com, it looks to you like you're interacting with your bank, but in fact you're not, um, because we don't verify that the IP address is the IP address associated with our bank. We rely on the domain name to be reliable. And so that's what creates uh, one of the security risks is if, if somebody intercepts, uh, uses the domain name system to intercept data. Um, <clears throat> Let me go back to our slide. Um, we're in a world, uh, for those of you who are involved in the domain name issues, uh, life is about to get much more interesting. So these top level domains, originally there were seven, .com, .gov, .mil, .edu, .org. Those were the basic ways of dividing up different types of users or, and, and, and things. And they were created by a single guy named John Postel. And for a long time, he was the domain name system. He was the guy who handed out domain names. And he just, and, and, in turn, and we also have country code uh, domain names. That can get political, is .pl for Palestine. Who decided there's a .pl? He 
he said, I'm just going to go to the United Nations. Anybody who's a country according to the United Nations gets a top-level domain. And for a while, he was just giving it out to whatever computer scientist in that country said, yeah, I'll, I'll deal with that. that. Those were the early days of the Internet. Soon, governments got involved. They demanded the right to um, assign a registrar for the .us or the .uk domain. And so those are all administered by different authorities. And we had a limited number of those authorities. That limited number is now exploding. Um, so the, the, the company that runs this was a US government contractor. Um, it's now, it's, it's a nonprofit organized under the laws of California um, called the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, otherwise known as ICANN. ICANN has a very complicated organization chart. Um, and they have decided as a matter of policy to permit um, hundreds of new top-level domains to, to be out there. So instead of just .com, .net, .org, now you're going to have .disney, .amazon, lots of other dots. Um, and so the opportunities for mischief grow as the number of different domain names are out there. Each of those database administrators needs to be secure enough in the way that they translate domain names into IP addresses that they can't be hacked in the, in the way that I, I suggested. Um, all right, so some people have said they've lost audio and others have not. Um, sound is back, huh? I'll tell you what, I will speak in the handset. Is this audio better? If somebody can just give me a quick um, verification. I'm waiting. Yeah, here we go. Uh, it's the same to you. Okay. Well, I've picked it up, so let's let's um, let's finish with. I'll be on the handset. Um, <clears throat> so we're about to get a number of these uh, so-called GTLDs, generic top-level domains. Each of these will be a database that um, resolves itself into an IP address. If there is content associated with one of these domain names. Um, it may become the subject of a seizure by DHS authorities, but just so you're clear about what it means to seize a domain name, it merely means a direction to the um, uh, database administrator to change the IP address associated with that name so that when people use the name to find content, instead of finding the um, the harmful or the unlawful content, they are directed to a different IP address. But the source of that original content remains on the internet because they still have a web server that still has an IP address. And anybody who can type the IP address in will still find that content. All right, we're, oops, we will go back to, um, and I just talked about that. Um, so now a couple of other security risks, but but before before I launch into this um, uh, part of the presentation, I, I want to make sure if people have questions, that was a lot of information I downloaded. I usually try to stop at 20 minutes, and I, I went almost an hour without uh, stopping. So if there are people who've got um, things they want to uh, uh, let us know or you want me to address, now's a good time. Yeah, so one of the questions is the IP address is associated with a specific computer. So yes, just so, so we're clear, when you're using the internet, you have an IP address. But it comes from who's ever giving you net internet access. So as you move around, if you go to Starbucks, you get a different IP address than when you're at DHS 
offices than when you're at home because you've moved from one network provider to another. And so that becomes part of the challenge when you're trying to trace somebody is you have to know who had that IP address at that time. And if somebody's using it at Starbucks, Starbucks doesn't know anything about the machine other than a machine that came in and asked for an IP address and I gave it one. Um, and so usually um, these sort of uh, digital forensics requires getting other information, other circumstantial evidence to try to match the harmful communications with a particular um, uh, uh, or a particular source. Um, in in the uh, field of what's sometimes called cyber warfare, this is one of the big challenges. Is you know it's it's a um, it's a very serious matter under international law to attribute um, an act of aggression to another state, and you want to make sure you can do that. So, for example, many people believe that the Russian government was behind a cyber attack on the on Estonia. Uh, but the ability to attribute that based only on IP addresses was not sufficient for uh, that to be kind of an official recognition because it's so easy to spoof the IP address or hide the IP address. Um, so yes, every machine has an IP address, but it's also easy to lie about what your IP address is. Um, okay. I'm just checking. I don't see any new questions, so I'm going to uh, continue on. I appreciate your uh, perseverance. Uh, we still have 133 people connected. Um, so when when we think about um, cybersecurity, what we're thinking about is is basically which of these features about the way the internet works are the source of the risk, and then what are the techniques or strategies for identifying and mitigating uh, and responding to these risks. Um, so we talked about, um, you know, the fact that software instructs a device and the device responds to the instructions. So the biggest risk is that something in the instructing code has been manipulated in a way that's causing the device to behave in a way it's not supposed to. Maybe it's revealing confidential or top secret information that it shouldn't be. Um, maybe it is transmitting data. Um, so a botnet, for example, would be a case where I insert some code on your machine and your machine now in the background is launching an attack on someone else's machine. And you don't even see it happening. Um, if you know, it's sometimes called a zombie net, um, and there are cybersecurity experts deal with this kind of risk all the time. You get a, a website, popular website, gets infected. It transmits little pieces of um, code to every user that visits that website. That code is then sitting on hundreds of thousands of machines. It hasn't yet been activated. So everybody knows that there's a risk that somebody might get targeted by this zombie net, but nobody has been targeted yet. And it's very hard to um, to try to, to defeat uh, that. You know, And usually that's done to launch, for example, a denial of service attack. Um, uh, so, and let me just, a question, is there a way to engineer hardware and software to assign each computer its own IP address? Um, there is a version of that kind of proposal. Could we each have a permanent ID, right, is, is the idea. Is there, is there a way to get rid of anonymity so that you're, you're actually unable to hide your identity? You have to own your communications. It's a proposal, but this is where you know you get into the world of trade-offs. Yes, that would make the internet more secure. It would also mean that um, you know uh, human rights activists in authoritarian countries and other people who rely on anim anonymity would be unable to engage in that kind of activity, and it would require massive re-engineering um, that would be very expensive. And who bears the cost um, it, it is a, an issue that r routinely comes up. So it is possible to do it, 
but it would there'd be a lot of resistance um, okay so we talked a little bit more about the Internet of Things but I just want to uh, you know every time that software um, goes somewhere all of these kinds of uh, capabilities and risks go go with them um, so here are a couple of you know uh, the types of threats and risks to be on the lookout as you're thinking about um, you know whether you're entering into a contract with a private contractor and you want to some assurances in the contract about uh, how they will identify and mitigate these risks or whether you're in the investigative posture and, and uh, looking for somebody who's engaged in one of these behaviors um, you know the weakest link is always the problem a lot of these are human based you know people give up their passwords they choose insecure passwords um, so you know the social side of cybersecurity is a big piece of it um, and 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 that's always going to be uh, one of the issues so um, you know we've seen increasingly uh, greater attention to password protection um, you know that websites won't let you just do one two three four anymore they'll require you know I need an exclamation point and this and that the theory there is that those are harder passwords to hack because um, well it's it's basically math you have to do a lot more crunching number crunching in order to guess that kind of password um, different types of malware so malware is a generic term for any kind of software that's designed to do something you don't want it to do that can cause harm um, so key loggers I can uh, somebody can put a piece of code on your machine it will record every keystroke that you everything you type and it will then transmit that um, to whoever's uh, tracking you um, there are any, there are ways in which um, somebody can uh, turn on your webcam and record you uh, if you see sometimes if you're in in a public place you might see somebody with a piece of tape over their webcam on their laptop that's somebody who's knowledgeable enough about that risk and is worried about it um, there's software called ransomware that w will basically send you a message that says I'm about to wipe all of your data all of your photos all of your music all of your company files unless you pay up um, and then there are all these other kinds of things that can be running in the background um, that, that uh, the user is not aware of um, <clears throat> a virus is usually um, carried in some kind of host it's, it's what I talked about at the opening of the presentation it's it's data that is um, masking itself so the worst is anytime you get an email or, or somebody gets an email and it says here click on this link clicking on that link activates the transmission of code that then can then do the harm and that's you know when people email administrators this is the worst thing in the world it's sometimes called a phishing attack or a, a spear phishing attack spelled p-h-i-s-h -S -S is the worst that's when somebody uses an email address that you've communicated with they speak and act as if they know you and then they invite you to click on a link or give them password information or some other kind of information um, and that's one of the most common sort of spam based attacks uh, whoops let me worms are just a, a piece of malware that spreads from computer to computer um, <laughs> and uh, here are a couple of others we've talked about uh, denial of service a distributed denial of service is when you get many different computers to all seek to uh, interact with a particular server at the same time <clears throat> uh, buffer overrun every machine has a memory buffer that in which data is stored as it's processing it if you overwhelm it you can basically get past it with with the mal malware data um, zero day attacks this is a popular topic in the security community so we all rely on the software the software has all kinds of ways in which it can be exploited uh, so I'm now thinking about your operating system your browser 
if it's Microsoft Explorer, Firefox, Safari, Chrome, whatever, um, if somebody discovers that flaw and hasn't and nobody else knows about it, that you get a one it's you know, you get to use it once before it gets patched. Um, and so there's actually an active market and a trade among what are called black hat uh, hackers in these zero day attacks. And the US government is in that market. Uh, we are purchasing um, access to these zero day attacks primarily for defensive purposes, although it is alleged for offensive purposes as well. And it is a contra it's controversial about whether that's good policy or not because by participating in the market, you then essentially vindicate or validate the existence of the market. Um, and you get a debate about whether you're making things worse um, by actually doing that. Um, <clears throat> and then, as I mentioned, there are ways to um, manipulate the, the data in the packets that you're sending out so that you are not actually sending out your real IP address or you are not really the, the um, website that you purport to be by um, redirecting traffic from uh, some from a URL. Uh, I'm just checking the, our um, our questions. Um, all right, so um, I have a list here. Some of these are. Uh, this is from a, a presentation that includes the legal aspects of of this, but um, uh, there's some information there. Um, also, if you're interested in some of what I um, have said and you want more information, I've actually found that the website HowStuffWorks.com uh, is able to explain the technology in fairly straightforward ways. Um, unfortunately, that website has changed the way they present the information so that you get a lot of advertising, <laughs> but the content is still pretty good. Um, in general, I would say the Wikipedia entries about these things are good, but they're often written by people who are geekier than you and I. And so the Wikipedia sometimes becomes too technical too quickly. Um, um, but there are, and then YouTube has a number of videos that will sort of show you visuals of, of how these interactions work. Um, so I, I think that's the essence of, of what I want to communicate. We could talk more about some of these other kinds of risks, um, but but the essence, I mean, to reiterate the basic point, it's because digital information is so easy to copy, it's so easy to modify, and it describes what you're trying to present or it instructs the machine on what it should do, and the ease with which you can manipulate those descriptions or those instructions is what gives rise to the basic risk. Um, and we can look at different attempts to authenticate, but you know we're we're now in we have what's called network effects. We're baked into this network architecture, and changing architecture is difficult because you've got it. The internet at its bottom is kind of an agreement. It's agreement by everybody to use the same set of protocols. You need to get everyone to agree to change those in order to change the network architecture. And and as the network keeps getting bigger more people have to agree. Um, so I'm looking in the question window to see if anybody else has questions. Um, okay, here's one. Uh, so the US participates in zero day. Do other countries too? My, my understanding is yes. Um, um, and yeah, so again, some of this is more above board than others. Uh, you know, what we know is that it is the ex explicit policy of some of these countries to participate in zero day in the zero day market, and one would suspect that there are many other governments that are participating but not advertising their participation. Um, are there other questions? It does take a little while to type, so I'm going to wait and see if anybody else comes in. Um, 
is there a way to combat spear phishing? Never click on links and attachments. Yes. So that's <laughs> that is the advice. Never click on links or attachments from uh, basically anyone that you aren't 100% sure is the sender uh, of that email. Um, and usually, and you know, sometimes if you're moving quickly and you know they'll have a subject line like, "Hey, check this out." It's so tempting if you're on your phone in particular to just, you know, uh, look at that link or click on it. Um, but that is the risk, and especially if you're in like an enterprise network, um, it, it can lead to lots of problems for all the users if if you click on that link because if you start spending out sending out spam inadvertently. Your website, your your IP address can actually get blocked by other people on the network, thinking that you're you're a, a spam sender. Um, you're and so uh, it is a risk. And yeah, the, the the people who hack in this way have become ever more talented at disguising spam. Um, is using a work VPN on public Wi-Fi adding a sufficient layer of security? Uh, well, it depends on what you mean by sufficient. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about encryption, but basically what you're doing when you're using a VPN is you are encrypting the data that you're sending. Um, you And it's pretty hard to hack the encryption. The, the encryption... Um, is is quite powerful. The risk is that the encrypted data then has to be translated into clear text at some point. But as long as it's encrypted during the transmission, um, I would say, you know, I'm not going to give you a legal opinion about the handling of top secret and classified information. But in general, as a, as a practical day-to-day -day matter, you're pretty secure. Um, if if you're using VPN encryption, it's pretty robust encryption. Um, what about the hardware that routes and transmits the information? Who owns that? Can anyone just tap in? Uh, it's a good question. I didn't really go into that as much, but in the suppliers of the physical layer um, are largely what we call um, backbone providers, and they're really about four or five companies, maybe it's it's shrunk a little bit, who um, have gotten permission to lay most of the fiber optic cable um, that carries most of the internet data. Um, and one of the fascinating things about the internet is the way they deal with each other is by private contract. Unlike the telephone system that's regulated by the FCC, um, these data providers have what are called peering agreements where they basically say, I'll carry your packets if you carry mine. And then if there's an asymmetry between, you know, who's sending more packets than the other, there might be some monetary exchange. Uh, but in general, there's just a um, an exchange of data by contract. Um, <clears throat> and it's private. So the internet it, although we call it the public internet because it's publicly available, the truth is that almost all of the internet is privately owned and operated, um, certainly in the U.S. Um, did fa does Facebook log websites I've been to previously? Well, any website that has the like button on it, they've re Facebook recorded the fact that you visited that website because you loaded the like button from Facebook's server, and therefore you transmitted data about your machine and your IP address to Facebook in order to get the like button loaded on that page. And and that's the thing, that that's all happening in the background. Nobody asked your permission to go touch Facebook's server when all you wanted was CNN, you know, um, and that's, I think that's the one of the issues for people is they're unaware of the fact that you don't have control over those kind of um, background data trans transfers. Um, codes of ethics, either the ABA or state codes, uh, are changing to add requirements on lawyers. Is cybersecurity becoming part of the ethics responsibilities? So I used to 
be more up to date on this? I, 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 the answer is definitely yes. Um, but in terms of both sort of malpractice, what's the standard of care and your ethical obligations to keep information confidential, um, I am not up to date on the state of the art. I can remember when I graduated from law school in the mid-1990s and I wrote a memo for a client on, or actually for the law firm on the use of email because it was a, it was an ethics question um, in the 90s whether you could communicate with um, your clients by email recognizing some of the insecurities of email and the practicalities of you know internet communication just overwhelmed the objections there was a time when it was considered risky um, but definitely uh, one of the big cutting edge issues I'm aware of is is whether you can if you migrate, for example, to Microsoft Office 365 and now you're using a cloud server for all of your data, now your client, conf you know, your client communications are sitting on a Microsoft owned and operated server. Have you then breached confidentiality? Um, and I, I'm not, I believe the answer will have to come down to be no, as long as Microsoft promises a certain level of privacy. But right now, I think that's an actively debated question about whether the cloud services are sufficiently secure um, uh, in terms of your, your duties. Um, so the question, we've all ordered online with comparative safety and security. What structure does secure socket layers provide or where in the internet structure do those operate? Right. So. Um, the, that's one of those protocols in the alphabet soup, the so-called SSL um, protocol, and it, it's it's a it, it's a pretty robust form of um, encryption. It it's, uses what's called uh, public key encryption, um, and it, 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 we don't have time to go into it. But basically, half of the um, Whenever you encrypt, you're basically just translating the clear text into something else. If we did Pig Latin, you know the rules. I can talk to you in Ig Pay Atten Lay, right? I, that was just a quick translation of Pig Latin uh, by operating on a simple set of rules. All encryption, all forms of encryption, do some version of that. What public key encryption does is is take two data sources to do the translation. One is a public key that anyone else can share, and then the other is a private key that um, that basically allows the two ends of the only the two the sender and the receiver to be able to decrypt the data. So you can see what I use to encrypt it, but without the private key, you cannot decrypt it. And the SSL technology relies on that. Now, um, maybe you heard there was a Actually, there was a big hole in in the SSL. So, one of the problems with these open standards is it's nobody's job to basically manage them. And so, a number of the big internet companies will have one or two developers spend some time keeping these up to date. But, but in fact, even though we all rely on that uh, secure layer of the internet. It was a very small group of programmers who were doing it for free, keeping that up to date. And somebody discovered this so-called heart bleed uh, defect in the SSL, which allowed for a buffer overrun, and suddenly you could break break, break through the encryption. Um, and all the internet companies were scrambling to to patch the the heart bleed problem on their e-commerce websites. And since then. A number of these companies have now pledged to put more people on the problem because it's the problem of a commons. If every if it's everybody's to use, whose job is it to keep it up to date? Um, question: In my experience, do you believe attorneys understand technology enough? No, uh, I still am talking to students uh, who are active internet users. They spend hours and hours a day on the internet, but don't have any reason to look behind the screen in terms of how what's going on um, and as I said at the opening I think attorneys need to spend more time uh, understanding hopefully the kinds of information that I just uh, gave you about what's really going on uh, malpractice issues with lack of knowledge understanding I could see that I mean I gave you the example of the attorneys 
that asked for an injunction only on the domain name without understanding that they weren't actually getting the relief that they were seeking. <laughs> um, and, and I worry about uh, issues like that. Younger attorneys more savvy? Surprisingly, no. It, uh, that, in fact, um, in a way, it's so easy to be an internet user now that you don't have to know as much as we did back before. I'm old enough to remember before Windows when you actually had to know what commands to type in to get your machine to do things. In the world of DOS, uh, you actually kind of needed to know a little bit about what was going on because that was the only way you could get your computer to work. Um, and as we got Windows and now we got apps and Apple makes using, you know, they emphasize usability, but what that really means is you don't have to know what's going on. We'll make it easy for you. And most of the students I'm teaching have grown up in a digital environment where it's all kind of easy. And so why, why bother? Uh, what are the biggest shortcomings of firewalls? So a firewall is basically just um, a way in which you try to authenticate the data that's coming in or going out based on one of these uh, um, attributes. But what are you looking for? Is it, you know, if I'm looking for a trusted IP address, if the sender is just spoofing the IP address, they're going to get past my firewall. Or if I'm trying to block based on IP address, um, as I mentioned with the proxy servers, somebody just routes their traffic through another IP address and they'll get around my firewall. So are they useful for intranets? Sure. But they have these vulnerabilities. And so, like I, as I would say with all these security issues, they're, they're going to perform in some percentage of the cases, but against a determined foe, they're, they're beatable. Excuse me. Um, I'm looking. That looks like the last question I have in the list. And how are we doing on time? We're getting close to time. Um, <clears throat> maybe give a minute. And um, let me. Um, I have Dan and Michael Becker in the room, so let me go back to. Um, I'm going to briefly put you on hold so I can. Uh, go hands-free and see if they want to add anything. Okay, we're live. Dan, Michael, any any concluding thoughts? No, I think this has been really um, great. And I appreciate everybody's um, uh, questions and interaction. Um, I'm just struck again by how many people participated in um, live in this, and, and and I hope that our colleagues who did, were not able to participate today, there are 2,000 of us across the country will be able to access this over time. I thought this was really um, tremendous to, to get some of the um, infrastructure the, of the internet um, laid out for us. So really, really appreciate your time and your expertise. And um, I think with that, we're, we're, we're done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Let me just find how to... Okay, I'm going to stop showing screen. And